Linda saw a homeless man in rags. She was pissed by his presence and kicked him out of her restaurant. She was shocked when she discovered who he truly was. Inmate 301, the chief warden called out, banging the metal rails with his baton. The sound echoed through the cell block, jolting Chris awake in the corner of his cell. Chris, a black man in his late fifties, leaned back against the wall, shivering and mumbling incoherently. He'd spent over 30 years in the U.S. correctional system. Inmate 301, come forward, the chief warden called out as he unlocked the cell. Chris got up slowly, his emaciated frame and sickly appearance evident. Dark circles hung under his eyes, and he wobbled toward the cell door. Congratulations, you've completed your service, the warden informed him. Chris froze, overwhelmed by mixed emotions. Thirty years in the U.S. correctional system had stripped him of any sense of time or self. This was the moment he'd longed for, yet now that it was here he felt an abyss opening beneath him. He wished he could just vanish. He wasn't married, had no children, most of his family had deserted him, leaving him completely alone. There was no one. Nothing at all for him out there, only pain, solitude, and misery. The warden led him to a counter where he signed his release documents. Enjoy your freedom. The warden patted him on the back with a mechanical smile. Chris said nothing. He walked out of the correctional center without looking back. At first, his steps were slow, uh, uncertain. Then he started to run, faster and faster, as if fleeing some unseen horror. Sweat poured down his face and his tears mingled with it. The soles of his feet ached, but he couldn't stop. He ran as if something monstrous was chasing him, driven by a desperate need to escape the life he was leaving behind. After almost 40 minutes of running, Chris finally halted. He lifted his eyes to the sun, but it brought no hope, only a reminder of how empty and hopeless he felt. He wandered the streets aimlessly for another hour before stumbling into a small shed. He slumped against the wall, swallowing frequently to ease the dry patch forming in his throat. Feeling himself losing consciousness, Chris decided to beg for food. He returned to the streets, asking for help. With the money he got after a few hours of begging, he bought some junk food from a supermarket, enough to last him a few days. As the sun set, he realized he had no idea where he would spend the night. After hours of walking, he found a bridge. It wasn't safe, but it was his only option. He slowly walked under it and sat down, praying he wouldn't be robbed or assaulted by drug addicts. He leaned against a lonely, sad wall and immediately dozed off. The sound of a train early in the morning woke him up. Refreshed, Chris was determined to regain his independence and dignity. To achieve this, he knew he needed to secure a steady job to support himself and find a place to call home. However, Chris felt lost and uncertain about where to begin. His past life as an accountant seemed like a distant memory, and he feared his skills were now outdated. The harsh reality of his criminal record also loomed over him, making it unlikely that any reputable company would give him a chance. With a mix of anxiety and determination, Chris wondered how he could overcome these obstacles and start anew. His only option was to find work on a construction site or do manual labor. He stopped by an abandoned railway station to eat his snacks, then headed toward a quarry. There was a construction site nearby, and he approached the man in charge. The man laughed when he saw Chris, noting his emaciated state. Your bones are too frail. I can't have you dying on my site. The man in charge dismissed him, but Chris insisted. Please, I need this job, I'll do anything. The man could see the hunger in Chris's eyes, the desperation to prove himself, so he finally agreed to let him work. The job was exhausting at first, but he managed to do all his tasks for the day. When he was paid, a glimmer of hope appeared on his face. This was the first money he'd earned in 30 years. He shared his story with the man in charge, who allowed him to sleep at the site. As night fell, it became very cold and dusty. With no clothes for warmth, Chris found a thick rug and wrapped it around himself. Despite the harsh conditions, he was glad to have survived the night. The next day, Chris decided to have a proper breakfast. 
He hadn't eaten good food in years. He walked a while until he arrived at a restaurant. He walked in and headed to the counter, where a cashier handed him a menu. After glancing through it, he ordered a coffee and a burger. Suddenly, a woman emerged from the inner room and marched towards him. She had a look of disgust on her face. She was Linda, the restaurant manager. She'd seen Chris on the security camera when he stepped in. She approached him but kept her distance, then pointed to the exit. We don't tolerate crazy people here, Linda barked. Chris was shocked at her outburst. He assured her that he wasn't crazy and even showed her a few crumpled dollars he had to pay for his food. Linda responded by screaming at him and threatening to call security. She scrutinized him closely and then spat at him. This is a restaurant. How will people get comfortable when they see a dirty old man like you? Chris was stunned but continued to convince her that he meant no harm. Linda refused to listen and threatened to tear his rags and throw him out. As Chris kept talking, Linda grabbed a used cup on the counter and spilled coffee on him. She then called security. Throw this lunatic out of my restaurant. Linda was a very proud and arrogant person. She loved to make others feel small and weak. She would often say mean things to people she thought were beneath her. This made her feel better about herself. Linda was mean to people because she was unhappy with her own life. She felt empty inside and didn't know how to fix it, so she took out her frustrations on others. But this didn't make Linda a happy person. She was still unhappy and lonely. She didn't know how to be kind or friendly. She only knew how to be mean and hurtful. Chris felt humiliated as the security guards roughly dragged him out of the restaurant. He struggled to free himself from their tight grip but lacked the strength. They tossed him onto the ground and he lay there, groaning in pain. As he got up, tears welled in his eyes. Just as he was about to cross the street, he heard a familiar voice calling his name. Chris turned quickly and saw a familiar figure emerging from the restaurant. Wiping his tears, he realized it was his former boss, Mike Brown, the man who'd sent him to jail. Mike waved frantically at Chris. Chris's heart pounded as Mike ran towards him. When he got close, Mike began to apologize, his words tumbling out in a rush. Chris felt a surge of anger. His hands trembled. It had been 30 years since he'd last seen Mike. 30 years of hell. 30 years of loneliness. Mike had never even visited him in prison. He hadn't believed that he, his boss, his friend, had let him rot in a cell for something he didn't do. I've been looking for you for over two years, Chris, Mike stammered, his voice breaking. I had trouble finding you. You were moved between six different prisons. Some of the transfers were missing. Chris's vision blurred with rage and pain. You should have looked harder, he spat. You should have believed me. Mike's face crumpled. I know, I know, I failed you. So sorry for everything. He begged, his eyes pleading. Chris's mind raced. He thought about the years of suffering, the lost time, the broken dreams. Sorry, he repeated, his voice rising. You think sorry is enough? Mike's eyes were filled with tears. You were innocent, he whispered. The words hit Chris like a punch to the gut. The words he'd longed to hear for 30 years. The words that could have saved him. He let out a roar of anguish, the pain and fury of three decades bursting out of him. He lunged at Mike, grabbed his collar, and shook him. Where were you? Chris screamed, his voice cracking. Where were you when I needed you? You let me rot. You let me suffer. Mike sobbed openly now. The weight of his guilt crushed him. I was a coward, he admitted. I didn't fight for you. Uh, I'm so, so sorry, Chris. Chris shoved him away, tears streaming down his face. It's too late for sorry, he said, his voice hollow. Mike fell to his knees. His body shook with sobs. Please forgive me, he whispered. Chris had worked as a trusted accountant for one of the largest firms in the U.S., where he was responsible for auditing financial records and conducting regular checks on the firm's private businesses. However, his career took a dramatic turn when a staggering $5 million worth of goods suddenly went missing from the company's warehouse, 
and an additional $10 million was transferred from the company's account into an untraceable private account. During investigations, Chris's digital footprint and work habits were meticulously scrutinized during the investigation. It was discovered that his login credentials had been used to access the company's financial systems on the day of the transfer, and his computer had been used to generate the transaction documents. Furthermore, a review of his email communications revealed a suspicious pattern of deleted messages and encrypted files, hinting at a possible cover-up. Additionally, the investigation found that Chris had been working late nights and weekends in the weeks leading up to the incident, claiming to be catching up on paperwork. However, his colleagues reported that he seemed nervous and agitated during this time, and one even recalled seeing him arguing with an unknown person in the parking lot. The evidence seemed to suggest that Chris had been acting suspiciously in the days leading up to the embezzlement, and his digital trail implicated him directly in the crime. Security footage also showed Chris's access card being used to enter the warehouse on the night of the theft. While the footage was grainy, it appeared to show Chris's vehicle parked near the loading dock, and a figure matching his build and height was seen loading crates into the vehicle. Investigations revealed the name of the driver who had transported the consigned goods to an undisclosed location. However, the driver was missing, one person who could potentially clear Chris's name. The police continued their search until they discovered the driver's body in a ditch. Found unconscious and missing an arm, he was rushed to the hospital, but the doctors confirmed he would not survive. With no way to exonerate Chris, the case proceeded to court. The jury found him guilty, sentencing him to 30 years in prison. Chris spent days locked in the dark cell, crying and clinging to the hope that he might somehow prove his innocence. He wished for a miracle that would allow the driver to survive and clear his name, but as time passed, it became clear that hope was fading. Ultimately, he resigned himself to his fate in prison. What hurt him the most was that his boss, Mike, never believed in his innocence. Mike and Chris have been close friends since their high school days. During their time there, Chris often defended Mike from bullies. Mike came from a wealthy family, while Chris grew up in a struggling household. Chris was fortunate to win a scholarship to a prestigious university, the same one Mike went to. Their friendship remained strong after graduation. Mike became the CEO of a major firm and appointed Chris as the head accountant. Chris had hoped that their long-standing bond and history of trust would lead Mike to believe in his innocence. They had always supported each other like brothers, and Chris had never betrayed that trust. During one of Mike's visits to the prison before Chris's sentence, Chris's eyes locked onto Mike's. He held his hands firmly. Trust me, Mike. I'm your best friend. I'd never hurt you, he begged, his voice cracking with desperation. But Mike pulled away. His eyes were cold and hard. What if you've always been jealous of me? Mike spat. Tell the truth and the judge will go easy on you. Chris's face contorted in anguish. We're supposed to be friends. We're supposed to be a team. He screamed, slamming his fist on the table. The sound echoed through the visiting room like a death knell. Security guards immediately rushed in. They dragged Chris away as he struggled and shouted, You're my friend! You're like a brother to me! The words were torn from his throat like a plea from a broken heart. As Chris was forced back into the darkness of his cell, the sound of his own despairing cries haunted him. The thought of Mike's words, like poison, seeped into his soul. What if you've always been jealous of me? The question swirled, tormenting him, as the darkness closed in. Now, Chris was bewildered when he heard the word innocent. Mike continued to apologize before revealing the new developments to him. The driver had survived against all odds after a traumatic brain injury, but lost his memory of the incident. Almost three decades later, his memory slowly returned, and he recalled everything. He went to the company and reported that Chris was innocent. The real culprit was Mike's brother. He was a drug addict and known as the black sheep of the family. He had never been close to his father and had always been at odds with him. Desperate for money to settle a gang-related issue in Russia, he knew he wouldn't get enough from his brother or father, so he stole from the company and did a perfect job framing Chris. 
The goods were later claimed by his gang. When the driver threatened to expose the truth, Mike's brother ordered his men to kill him. Fortunately, the driver survived despite losing an arm. After the driver recovered, he experienced partial amnesia. Yet another attempt on his life was made by Mike's brother. He narrowly escaped and fled to another town for safety. Years later, his memory fully returned, and he went back to the company to report what had happened. Mike's brother and his gang members were subsequently arrested and facing trial. By then, Chris had already spent 29 years in prison. Mike had done his best to locate him, but his transfer documents had been missing. The cops had promised to look into it. Unfortunately, they hadn't been able to, and Chris eventually completed his jail term. Chris was overwhelmed with emotion as he listened to the entire story. He'd spent 30 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. The pain of the unjust sentence and the harsh words Mike had said during his trial came flooding back. I was warned not to make you an accountant. You blacks are always up to no good, Mike had said to him after his first trial in the court. Chris felt an immense sense of relief at finally being vindicated. Although he'd lost everything over the years, he was grateful that the truth had come out. I was a fool for not believing in you, Mike pleaded. Chris shrugged and walked away, ignoring Mike's desperate pleas for another chance. Mike followed, promising hefty compensation and a key role in his company, but Chris was unmoved. At almost 60, with no prospects of marriage or a normal life, he felt he'd lost too much already. 30 years of his life had been taken from him, and he'd endured betrayal and racial discrimination. He went back to the construction site, where he found himself unable to work. Overwhelmed by feelings of betrayal, he cried for an hour before grabbing some snacks. But as he ate, he craved a proper meal and decided to return to the restaurant the next day, hoping the manager would allow him to eat. Chris borrowed some clothes from the workers at the quarry. The next day, he took a thorough bath, dressed in the clothes he borrowed, and returned to the restaurant. Linda was at the counter, busy with her routine inspections. As soon as she saw Chris, she recognized him immediately. Her frustration was evident as she walked over to confront him. I thought I made myself clear enough that I don't welcome lunatics here, she barked. I'm not a lunatic, he replied to her. I just want to have a good meal. Then head to the garbage for your meal. We don't serve your kind here, Linda mocked. Then she shoved Chris, causing him to fall hard to the ground. Chris groaned as he tried to get up, only for a security guard to yank him roughly to his feet. Linda followed closely, and the security guard threatened anyone who let Chris back into the restaurant with a dismissal. As Chris stood up, he vowed never to return to the restaurant. Just as he turned to leave, he noticed a car approaching him. Moments later, Mike jumped out of the car. He fell to his knees and begged Chris for forgiveness. He'd been waiting around the restaurant, hoping that Chris would come again. Chris warned Mike not to follow him again, but Mike persisted, promising compensation for the lost years. I'm sorry I failed to believe you. The evidence pointed at you. I'm so sorry, Mike trembled. Then he grabbed Chris and pulled him into a tight embrace. He wept like a baby in Chris's trembling arms. I won't leave until you forgive me. For 30 long years, I've been consumed by anger and hurt. I thought you betrayed our bond, our friendship. But then I discovered the truth. You were innocent. Oh, Chris, the pain I felt was like nothing I'd ever known. It was as if my heart had been ripped apart. I died inside, brother. I died. I'm so sorry, Chris. I'm sorry for not believing in you. I'm sorry for the years we lost, the years I wasted hating you. Please, brother, forgive me. Forgive me. Let me make it up. Mike said. As he spoke, Chris's anger slowly gave way to compassion, and he decided to give their friendship a second chance. The two hugged for a long time. It's time to repay you for everything, Mike said, and truly, he kept his promise. Chris received a hefty compensation and was given ownership of an estate. He was then asked to select three businesses from Mike's father's chain. To his surprise, Chris found out that the same restaurant he'd been kicked out of belonged to Mike's father, so he chose it, along with two other businesses. Once the paperwork was finalized, Mike's wealth soared. After settling into his new life, 
Chris decided to visit his restaurant. This time, he walked in as its new owner. Linda had been informed earlier that the restaurant had a new owner, and she would need to submit reports to him. Linda had impatiently gone outside to check the parking lot to see if the new owner had arrived when she bumped into Mike at the restaurant. Seems someone lent you good clothes, or you stole them, it won't make me forget what you truly look like. Leave, dirty old man, Linda screamed. She was about to hit Chris when Mike suddenly showed up and yelled at her to stop. He asked her why she was about to hit her new boss. Linda was shell-shocked as reality sat in. She couldn't believe Chris knew Mike. Even more shocking, he was her boss. Linda immediately went on her knees and began apologizing. She cried profusely as she begged Chris to temper justice with mercy. But Chris remembered how she had treated him. He knew her type all too well. She had humiliated him for no reason, and now she was begging for mercy? He decided to teach her a lesson. I won't fire you, he said, but you'll work as a cleaner. You've caused pain to many people, including me. Now it's time to clean up your mess, literally. Linda was devastated. She had never imagined she'd be reduced to cleaning, but she had no choice. She picked up a broom and began sweeping the compound. Her head hung low in shame. She had spent so long hurting others, now it was her turn to feel the pain. What do you think about Chris's decision? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.